support is very important. Um, and as you see here, it was both the object of the story as well as the person who wrote the story, both their families disintegrated. Um, and I'm someone who family is very important for me. Um, I have two brothers. I don't worry about them because they know me. Um, so they know what I'm doing. They support me completely. Um, but I also have a widowed mother. Uh, and she's the sort who, you know, while she supports me, but her first instinct is always to be afraid. Um, you know, and she's, she's aging now. You know, so, so that's the normal thing. And I, I have to think about that, you know, because, uh, you know, sometimes like when, you know, something happens and I tell my brothers to call her up and tell her, because while I love you, I really don't want to hear this. Instead of asking what happened, she says, what did you do? <laughs> you know, I don't know whether it's an Asian thing or what, but I really don't need to hear that question at that moment. So I brief my brothers and I get them to call her, you know, just to sort her out. Okay. When she's calmed down and then she calls me and we talk. So my mother is always at the back of my mind, you know, while I've joked about uh, because there have been threats about contempt of court where I'm concerned, and I said, oh, finally a chance to lose weight. My mother was joking. <laughs> so I said, no, I hear all these complaints about the food there, maybe, you know. But nowadays I have gastric, so it might not help. You, know? um, you need a sense of humor to carry on. I think I'm very serious about what I do, but I think we need a sense of humor as well, and you need good friends. Um, I had a musician friend who died a few years ago from cancer, and at that time when I was in trouble, he said, Shaila, if they take you in, we will organize a concert for you, and I was like, for me? But I won't be there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be there drinking as well. Uh, so you have friends in lots of places, and I think that's where you draw your strength from. Uh, it's not from the law, it's, it's, it's not from lofty principles. <coughs> principles are important because a lot of principles, I, I, my life is based on them. Uh, they are who I am. Uh, you know, sometimes my friends think I'm anal because I won't budge from certain things. Uh, but you have to go on. Empathy is important, but your yeah, support is. That's why I'm still single. <laughs> Because it's difficult. I mean, I was telling, I was telling Mars, the husband didn't even last one year. You know, 244 days, and well, before that, he was already seeing this other woman. You know, and I'm like, what sort of marriage is this? I love you, I love you, we have a child, and the wife goes to prison, and suddenly he has to see this other woman. Sorry, my prejudice is coming to the fore. <laughs> Any any other families in the room who can comment on the the I'm an equalist? <laughs> okay, if the wife did the same thing, I would say the same thing. <laughs> but was it uh, actually? I want to raise any anyone has a question. I have for a question for you know, um, yeah, Pauline. You said something about the consequences of her her story, right? If she knew that it would result in the death of the CIA operative, would she have? I think, is it fair, I want to ask, is it fair for a reporter to have to think that far ahead, you know, to, to, to be responsible responsible for that far-reaching consequences? Anyone? In the room as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I heard somewhere, uh, those who uh, give up their security for liberty, give up their liberty for security, these are with the security and liberty. So I think, uh, the concern was the security of their families and security of the all the CIA operatives and the, or the liberty of the journalists to do their job. And if you if you give up your liberty for security, then you is a leader. That goes somewhere. So I guess uh, reporting is very important, uh, although it, uh, the consequences might be very but uh, if you start to compromise your uh, liberty for security, then it will become a domino effect. Like people start to question the credibility of the news, uh, and then people start.
start to fear the government, and then uh, you know the whole democracy <coughs> will not exist <coughs> as we know it. So um, yeah, I think um, had she been for 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 a democracy to really exist, you have to really defend the liberty or the credibility of the people to report, be it good or bad. Is everyone here in support of media freedom? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Responsible me media freedom, I think, yes. 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 Okay. Responsible in what sense? Yeah, you have, to, you, have, you have to take responsibility in whatever you report. Like, you just cannot be really needy. I mean, you read in, in Tucson, they report a lot of things as well, but nobody ever believes them now. You know? Yeah, you put uh, Tucson and, and, and any other paper, I think everybody will choose the other paper for you know, news and. But I, 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 I like to maybe un, uh, give my thoughts on, on, on uh, like what you said. Would you actually do it, you know, knowing that you will die? I think it, it really, uh, different people have different different levels of... of, of uh, I was just telling this other friend, she's married to a soldier. And I was telling her, how do you stand it when he goes off? And he's an American soldier of all, the, of all soldiers. Yeah, how do you stand it when he, he gets deployed? Even there's no war. You don't know what's going to happen because anything, the, the American soldiers, they're always being targeted, you know? So I was just, yeah, she was telling me she's got kids, you know? I, you know, I think she she must have figured all these things out before she got married to him. It's not like suddenly he's, he's a soldier. But I, I suppose they, they also would, you know, also think that that, that same way as well. You know, I, I, this job, I could die. So I'm willing to do that, so I, I don't mind doing it. Me, I, I'm not willing to... Die, so I don't do this soldiering nonsense thing. I do something else. You know, I think different reporters will do different things. I think. Yeah. So should Rachel be blamed for the CIA operatives death? I I don't no. think so. I, and I, and I and I don't think if she re, you know if it even bothers her that much. I think if not, I, I think that she would not have. You you see you're reporting and you're exposing a CIA agent. You know. Yeah, you, you, you really, well, I think what you, she would have thought that far already. It's not that she's the first one to, to, to expose an, an agent. There are so many other people who expose agents and, you know, uh, and other governments will come after the agents and agents do die. Uh, I, I will absolutely not say that the death of, of the CIA agent was a direct result of the reporting of certain, that certain thing. It, she reported but when she resigned from her CIA spot, her security to her personal data was released by the CIA themselves. And it should have been the responsibility of the CIA to protect her after such release because she worked for the CIA. And it's the obligation of the CIA to protect her till whatever consequences. So it was the failure of the state that led to her death and not the direct result of reporting. You can't blame journalists who expose certain Stuff. So I would absolutely say it's the direct result of the state to not protect, protect its government servants. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? No, I, I, I think someone else pulled the trigger, right? Yeah. It was a right wing guy. The right yeah, right wing. It's, all, it's always the right wing guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think to pick up yeah, a point, um, uh, in, in law, right, um, what we have is called foreseeable consequences. So you need liable for things that you possibly can foresee. Right? So in this case, I, I would think that even the judge would not think that, that she would be liable because there's no way you can foresee that she would die. She may lose her job possible, right? her husband may divorce her, whatever is possible, but I think this is beyond, beyond something that anyone can foresee, so I don't think she should be liable. And I do like your point you know, about how you know, um, it was the government actually who... You know. But also you could also argue that she resigned, and she resigned knowing the consequences of not receiving the support. So it, she could, you know, we could also say that uh, some one factor would be uh, she, she knew what she was getting into by designing. Yeah. Yes, Mas. Um, uh, you know, earlier people were debating about whether to publish a story or not, or whether to pursue a story or not. And I think, like, um, the, the concept of minimizing harm, right? I think that's something that, um, in a lot of the codes of conduct of journalists, that's something that's very paramount. Journalists are supposed to any cost minimize, try to minimize the harm, whether in getting the story or as an uh, uh, as, as a product of you know writing something. Uh, but of course, I think you cannot 
you know, foreseeable, sorry, foreseeable consequences. You can only predict so much, right? I can walk out and die. I don't have to have a, you know, a, a, a job as a CIA covert operative in order to be, to be dead in an hour. For me, personally speaking, one of my principles is if I approach a source, is to brief them of the consequences. For me, personally, no story is worth where someone is harmed in the process of getting a story or publishing a story. So I always let it uh, have them basically the full details. This is what might possibly happen to you if they ever find out. Not from me, but some other means. And if they agree to it, then I use them as a source. Otherwise, I don't. Can I just throw something? Because it's somehow related. You remember the rape of the banana girls? Um, what would what would you do if you were in that position? Because in many ways, uh, you've got uh, you have to fight against the state. You know that the police, the, you know the loggers, whoever, uh, bring them to Kuala Lumpur, have a press conference. You know the threat against not just you but against the security of uh, the people as well uh, that you brought uh, the sources. So just to I want to throw it out to the journalist man. Uh, to let them know what would happen, what is the worst scenario, would make, let them uh, to give them a choice to make an informed choice whether they want to go for it or not. Because uh, I mean, uh, as a journalist, we can go as far as uh, let your voice be heard and um, let people know about your story, your suffering. But we cannot decide what is your life afterwards. So. Uh, without knowing the consequences of your choice, I think it's unfair to the person, I mean to the subject and also to the source. So uh, we have to let them know what would happen to them. If they are not willing to go for it, then I will not do the story. Because I, I can, I mean a story for me is, I mean, uh, they are more important than a story. Because their life is is uh, the real life. It's not. They are not. Uh, they are not numbers. They are person. So, if they are not willing to go for it, then I mean, there is no point to do the story. Sometimes when um, you know, in where I work, we have this policy that if someone's going to make allegations against someone else, uh, and if it's a complaint of you know impropriety or you know some sex offence or money. Uh, we, our way of covering ourselves is to ask, have you lodged a police report? Uh, not that people don't lie in police reports, but that's there. But sometimes I have, depending on what the issue is, uh, as you know, she said, that I warn them what are the consequences of lodging a police report. A lot of people, you know, when, uh, you know, if it's something as simple as your house is burgled, you don't see what happens once you lodge a police report? Um, and depending on the crime that you're alleging, um, it opens the door to the police to ask all sorts of questions, investigate all sorts of things, and basically, as they said, and the same thing, then the media comes in, because, you know, cops have friends in media, media have friends who are cops. The information gets out and that's it. You've lost control over your life. So it's not, uh, don't do it, but be advised that this thing could happen. Once it happens, your family's going to be involved, you know. Uh, can you handle this exposure? Can your family handle the exposure? Can your community handle the exposure? Uh, they need to be aware of all these things. Okay. Any other questions? How many of you love journalists more after this? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You can see a different mic. Ready now. to stand behind <laughs> Shala if she gets in trouble with organizer. <laughs> <laughs> and put public pressure. That was what was mentioned in the movie as well. They, they mm -hmm. sense that public pressure was waning and they needed to you know, continue yeah. doing it. Yeah. So no, that's I, very I, important. I mean, you made a comment. I, I am just curious you know, how much the public supports an extreme concept. Extract freedom like this, you know. Yeah, I 
think it was back in 1986, the star went on a campaign against the OSA. And to the extent that even the star journalists were having placards. But, you know, I wonder how much of the public were really behind it or were aware of the importance. Um, you know, sometimes in the end you wonder, you know, like for example, elections or people's decisions are made on so called bread and butter issues. And these kind of abstract concepts of freedoms like confidentiality of certain resources, or even official secrets, or even for that matter, ISA. You know, here we are talking in this nice middle class environment, intellectual, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, you know, for ordinary people, I, I, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm just throwing it out in the open. How much are we in, in reality here? Of course, to us as journalists, these are very important ideas. Which is secret, I you know, I'm just worried. I think it's a chicken and egg issue as well, right? Because the media haven't been allowed to talk about freedoms for a long time. It's still pretty much uh, you know, a taboo word. It's only recently when the Prime Minister himself promises to liberalise, you know, to reform and all that, that suddenly it's an okay word, suddenly you can talk about public assemblies, even though that law is nothing, nothing like what the Public uh, Freedom of Assembly Act should be. Um, I wish to respond to that. Yes. Um, I can give you numbers, a few hundred on our websites, because uh, uh, whenever we have uh, issues of uh, media freedom, journalists was uh, bad treated. Uh, we would put out a story, and in the end, at the end of the day, you can look at, you check out how many clicks is a few hundreds. That is the reality. A uh, few hundred from the public or from better journalists? I don't know. <laughs> Although, how sure. many hits in general on your uh, website? I mean, yes. uh, website. We have thirty thousand visitors per day, but. Uh, the clicks is like a few hundreds for the media freedom issue. Sometimes I feel very discouraged to see the numbers of the clicks. But, well, we have to do it because this, this is what uh, we are uh, we are trying to help our environment so that we can work more freely. So, even though it's only a few hundred clicks, we, we are still doing this. But I think it's important what you're doing. Well, what CIG is doing here, you know, these are all important steps. You know, building awareness, building consciousness. Uh, it's not something that can be achieved overnight. But I suppose back in 86, people were not so aware of things like OSA or the concept. You know, I, thanks to the internet, thanks to people like, you know, like you say, like Tan Huching's course was also helped by Roger Petra's detention. Um, thanks to this kind of, I mean, you need some popular traction like, for this kind of. Rather than just abstract freedoms, uh, as I say. So, so, as I said, but, but these campaigns are important. You know one thing? Pushing. Um, when uh, we send so uh, 80 over opposition to parliament, and then they, they, they said that they are going to have this uh, caucus for media freedom. Um, but we never realized there is oh. no caucus yet until now. It's already almost three years. So, I mean, we are talking about... Okay, I, sometimes I meet a few of them who say they have promised they want to have this caucus. They say, oh, we are new MPs, we are very busy, we, can, we, we, we can't hardly have time to do this. So, we can't uh, even lobby the BN MPs to join us. So, uh, we, are, we are stuck here, so we cannot proceed. So, that's the red. Interesting point. Um, I do agree with your point. I think, like I said, coming back to my point on how they don't, uh, the members of the public don't really understand what we do, yeah. right? So if they don't understand what we do, how they going to like support us, right? And uh, that reminds me of a case where I think there was a bird. RTM reporter who did a documentary on Bakun Dam um. uh, and he was sacked as well and apparently only like 80 old people turned up to support him and they were just fellow journalists <laughs> right? that's why I heard you know they, they protested but 80 over something and the, which means the mass public did not support and or did not understand the importance of it so I guess that's what I do uh, as, a, as in the education line to educate the students so that they can educate their family when they go back home yeah, 
So that's one way. The best way would be through the media, but then the media is hyped, as Shaila was saying, by the yeah, parliament. But you know, the different way, you know, I always say that yeah. there are more ways to skin a cat than, you know, just going straight, straight for it. Sometimes, as you say, these issues are abstract, but, you know, if you can put them down into language or words or instances where people can relate to and understand, then I think it comes down to that. Like uh, a lot of times when you know you go and ask people information, uh, they say, "Oh, uh, I want to be an anonymous source." Oh. For this story, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's like a culture. Yeah. You know, I don't know what movies they're watching or whatever it is. They want to be an anonymous source. <laughs> like, why? You know, it's, so I said no, and you know, it's. I need to educate them on when I would use it. So I said, you know, sometimes people want to go on the record. Um, and then I tell them, maybe you don't want to be named. You don't think about it. Then I tell them what the consequences are. You know, I, but a lot of people want to do that. They want to go, you know, like, off the record. So I'm telling you, like, oh, like but why? Yeah, just to add to the, to the context of the story, uh, I, uh, I read this um, blog by a freelance journalist who freelance for BBC. Uh, she's mentioned that she was trying to do a story uh, in a blog uh, about the EPF, the extension to, to, to the age of uh, I think 60 or 65. But she said even then, you know, people are so reluctant to come forward. <laughs> it's just a story, it's just a story, it's as simple as EPF extension. What are your opinions about it? And people are just so afraid to express their opinions. They're afraid that they might maybe give the country a, a bad name or, you know, they might say something stupid. People have been so scared of saying even something as simple as, as an EPF extension. So it's, that's how bad it is. Huh? You know how bad it is? There was a bunch of students here <laughs> who got scared. They a left. bunch of students, yeah, they left. Mm -hmm. They uh, were afraid to be associated with Annex Gallery because mm -hmm. of the sexual team where they are. And Ambiga and per se be illegal. That was, um, yeah, the whole bunch. But shouldn't they find that out before they survive? I don't know why suddenly, oh. yeah, what, what triggered this? This was on the itinerary. But you know what triggered that they suddenly yeah, left? I think it was all the F words. <laughs> <words. laughs> yeah, it could be that, you know, the F words. They felt uncomfortable. The idea of human rights is a... Uh, word, they do more on the internet than just... Yeah. Come on. And these are art students, you know. Oh, yeah. Art students are supposed to... They're here for field trip of all the arts venues. Yeah. So it's a field trip. Because half of them are at many galaxies, so maybe they... they mm -hmm. Maybe they found out that really serving them nice and fresh. No, no, I think the Asian team, we have... We are, we are just afraid of our own shadows, like seriously. Exactly. So, you know, I... Yeah. The, half the time, I feel like counselling people, and I just want a story. But <laughs> 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 you know, it's years I'm, so, I'm so grateful that my know? company's paying all the phone bills. But like, you know, I'm steaming, and I'm like, all sorts of counselling to don't be afraid. You know, and, and just it's 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 opening up. We, 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 I, I can see it throughout the years. It is it's opening up. Even even writing my first article, Pam. <laughs> I edited my first article, I was so afraid to even name the home minister's name and the IGP's <laughs> name. They, they, everybody knows their name, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, remember? Uh. So, so what is A very tall, definite... Uh, yeah, I, some, I, I was going to say somebody in the government <laughs> had mentioned. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, obviously but you did I, good. I think this fear... Like, yeah, you know, uh, are, my father kept telling me, you got two children. Why you go to jail? I think that <laughs> there are. Ah. I think what Rachel said uh, in that is that you say you will protect your source and because they are not interested to know uh, the, uh, the, about the dinner thing. I mean, the, the government is not going to go after you because you are just a small fry for them, you know? Yeah, but I think we're dealing with a sometimes very irrational government. They yeah. are, like sedition yeah. law is so broad. So yeah. there is there are grounds for this fear of expression among ordinary people because of how the government has been applying it like, have on the journalists. To say yeah. like a lot of times ministers issue threats, mm -hmm. they cite laws, 
but they have no blinking idea what the law means. And this is where I hold journalists accountable. They do not challenge the person because they themselves don't know what the section means. And then, you know, they faithfully write it down and it's seditious and everything. Come on, what the hell? This is not seditious. You know, it may have seditious tendency, but that is to be decided by a court. The judge will decide. Um, a lawyer friend told me very early on in my career, he said, Shara, anything you write is potentially defamatory. <laughs> Does that mean you're not going to write anything? Because I wrote this thing that involved the Lord President at that time. So I said, okay, you read it, because his firm used to represent the government. So I said, I want you to read it. He said, okay, why? Why me? He said, no, because then if the government decides to sue us, your firm cannot represent them. You have to, you have to say you've already given me advice, you see. So that's when he told me that. He said, so I said, oh, so there's a problem with my article? He said, no. He said, it's potentially defamatory. But you have your defenses. You know, so if you can prove your, your defenses, then the story goes. You know, anyone can say anything is defamatory. Anyone can say anything is sedition, and the way our law is drafted, it doesn't even say sedition, it's a, a seditious tendency, you know? Yeah. So you need to know these things. I mean, like the other day, okay, I, I mean, haven't but, really... But, but see, like, like for you, we are a bit more well acquainted with the law, yes, you know about sedition, but for ordinary young journalists who just come to the profession, but they don't know about the intricacies of what sedition means. But they must. Actually, you have to learn. But this is actually the responsibility of the media organization to, well, this is journalism 101, to educate young journalists on what the limits are. And the fact that the media organizations don't. No, I, th I think I agree with her. I think if the journalist is not taught in journalism 101, the journalist is obligated to go and find out for themselves. Not all, I think not all, not all journalists are journalism journalist yeah, graduates. Yeah, then you should find out for yourself. You want to be a journalist. Yeah, I think you should. I am not a journalism graduate. Yeah, I think you should then find out for yourself. La. You know, you know, I mean, uh, one big issue I see a lot of misreporting is when you talk about Islamic issues. Okay, uh, Some minister or some person you know, will stand out there and says, according to Islam. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You know, so you should ask because Islam has different levels of where you give credence to, you know, credibility of the sources. You need to pin that person down, you know, and especially if that person is a Muslim, they should know them since they're throwing Islam, you know, they're, they're probably replying or attacking someone else. Is this from the Quran? Is it from the Hadith? You go down, you know, you pin them down. You find a lot of time they don't know. Is this something they heard while drinking coffee something? You know, so you need whoever is standing up there and speaking, and especially any public official, you have to make sure that they know